Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about politics in school. Now, recently I had an educational consultant come on the podcast and one of the things he talked about, he said he has a podcast and if you can go back to the episode, you can even hear it where he has all these podcasts and he has these individuals who did all these studies, how politics weren't in school. And one of the things that he spoke about was that during these studies, they even went and they asked some of the kids, hey, are these teachers, you know, talking about politics in school? Kids say no. Then they go as far as, do you feel like you are going to be influenced by what your teacher's political beliefs are, even if they told you the answer was no. Now, politics is not only about, do you vote Democrat or Republican? Of course, they have different ideals and beliefs and they have different laws they typically vote for. That's not only what politics is going to be. Politics is more than just who you vote as president or who you vote as your senator or your congressman and woman, right? You are not only focused on the government type politics. I'm talking about society politics. Politics in school are going to be rampant across the country. And if you are in a public school, I guarantee you have politics in your school to some level, to some degree. Months, well, probably years ago now, I had a principal. And guess what? This is a principal of a Catholic school. And one of the questions I asked her, I said, hey, if you had a magic wand and you can wave that magic wand, what would you get rid of? It wasn't about the parents. It wasn't about anything else. She said, I would get rid of the politics in school. I doubt she was talking about the president. She was talking about the ideals and the stuff that people spew, right? Indoctrination in a sense. And then that is even something we talked about just recently in the podcast. Indoctrination can mean many different things. Indoctrination in the sense of politics in schools is we follow a set of systems that are in place to make us a viable member of society because we become indoctrinated in what it is to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a good student, what it means to be a valuable member of society. And I remember the guest had asked me, what does indoctrinated mean for you? And I was going to say exactly what it meant for him too, because I knew what indoctrinated meant for him. I basically said, well, indoctrination is going to be going against the values and beliefs of what your parents want for you. Because if we look at the statistic, most kids are going to look and they're going to follow into their parents' footsteps until a certain time in their life, typically when they're teens, and then they're going to start to look for their own identity. So if they're in the public school, there's a very strong possibility that they're going to follow the ideals of what maybe their peer groups are doing because they want to be associated with the peers. Why do you think so many parents are homeschooling now? Because they don't want their kids tainted or indoctrinated into the system that is not beneficial for them long term. We had the idea of double think. They're having these contradicting thoughts, and especially in politics and schools, they're contradicting beliefs. How many genders are there? Well, there's two, but yet there are some woke people or woke teachers will say, well, it could be fluid. You could be this, you could be that, you could have all of these pronouns. And I'm not making this a mindset OD episode. This is coaching a session, trying to be politically correct as possible, but there are politics in schools. And we do have to look at that. Then we have to be able to navigate through those politics. What does a parent do if they don't want their kids to be indoctrinated into the system of politics? I'm not going to say that you should take your kids out of the public schools, put them in private schools, do home tutoring, do homeschooling. I'm not going to say that. What I will say is if you have a strong family model in your household, you're going to be a step ahead of the game. What's happening in many schools or many families is that there's going to be some type of brokenness, some type of discrepancy. We have a range of single parents in the world today because we have the mindset of strong and independent. We don't need each other. You can ask a feminist on the street, hey, do you need a man? Oh, no, we don't need men because we live in a peaceful time. We go back to prehistoric times and cavemen and women. The woman would flock to the strongest male possible that would give them the best hope for survival. 
today we don't necessarily have to worry about that type of survival, right? We can get roofs over our heads. We can get food pretty easily. We don't have to grow our own food. We don't have to hunt or gather. Our life has become very simple in a sense. So we have gotten rid of the, I guess you can say, the foundational things that might have been the things that attracted us. But yet we cannot get rid of our biological tendencies of what a person truly wants. They want safety and security. So if we ask for preference, whether it be a man looking for a woman, he has his preferences, and then a woman looking for a man, she has her preferences. So it could be a certain height, a certain age, it could be a certain income bracket, whatever it be, that's a preference, right? Maybe skin color, hair color, culture, it's a preference. Just because you have a preference, it doesn't mean you're wrong. Today, in our world today, we can look at the different types of preferences, but it seems like only certain people can have preferences. Because men are attacked if they have preferences for women, right? Maybe it'd be a low body count. Maybe it'd be the idea that she has to stay at home and cook and clean and be a stay-at-home wife and not be a career woman because men don't value career women. It could be that. That could be a preference. Yet today, that's considered toxic. That is considered sexist. That is considered misogynist or misogynistic. Guess what? If it was the other foot, we're not going to say it's misandry. We're not going to say it's sexist. We're not going to say they're narcissists. We're just going to say, oh, you go, girl. You're powerful. And it's so interesting because I do my best to not have guests on the podcast that are going to be followed or so steeped into these political types of mindsets. The reason being, everyone has a voice, right? I don't mind. You can come on the podcast. We could talk. But at the same time, I have you on the podcast because I know that you are going to be able to help someone later on whether it be a school, whether it be a bunch of businesswomen, or be a bunch of businessmen, be a young woman, a young man, whoever in the world. This is a platform for you to have an outlet, to have a voice, to have a sense of, of credibility. And I do my best. Sometimes, you know, I bring on people who have these different views and it's perfectly fine. I remember when Joe Rogan, he got in trouble because I guess he had a couple of episodes in a row when he was only bringing on people who had, I guess, right ideals. Like they like Trump and they were like Republican. A lot of people were like hating on him and saying, why do you only have these type of guests on? This is not fair. You have a big platform. This is one sided. You're trying to influence culture. Okay. And if you think about it, it influenced a lot of people especially kids in schools. Teachers too, right? People were talking about Joe Rogan in schools. Okay, guess what? He basically came out saying, hey, that's not my intention. All these guests that are coming on are scheduled well in advance. And if I knew that someone was going to be this or this was going to be a big problem because I've had people who support certain presidents and people that support my president that I would vote for. So Democrat, Republican, politics, right? And so he says, well, I'll be more cautious about who I invite. And now he basically does like an alternation where he alternates between guests. Guess what? In a sense, I like to give some of that to here because I understand not everyone who listens to coaching and session, I understand that not everyone who's growing up and they need some type of guidance from a personal development podcast they're not going to have my ideals. And I'm probably not going to preach about those ideals all the time. So it's always nice to get a different viewpoint from a guest that I would probably not, you know, say like, oh, wow, they have a great mindset. They're doing all the good things, even though they have a great standing, whether it be they have a good amount of followers, maybe there's people who believe in them. Of course, you can always find like-minded individuals. That is not the problem. The problem is trying to cater to everyone. In a sense, you almost cater to no one. And I want people to understand that there are two sides always to the table. We have forgot how to have a proper dialogue. 
because people are just in their own mindsets. Well, you know, because of my experience, because, you know, this, because of that, I have interviewed, I don't, I don't know how many people, almost 200 individuals. That's a lot of people. They all have different mindsets. That's why I can interview one type of coach and talk to the same coach the next week. And I can have a totally different conversation. It's very interesting. And what I will say when it comes to politics and schools, they don't belong there. I don't know many parents that say, hey, I want politics in school. I'm not talking about history. I'm not talking about what happened in slavery. All of that should be talked about, right? Everything that's in the curriculum. We're not trying to change the curriculum from the old. We need to get rid of all the standardized testing. It doesn't help the kids. It actually detracts from them, believe it or not. It creates more limits in their mind. But yet, we have taken teaching to a different level, to a different extreme. We are still in the idea of normalized school, but now has become normalized testing. We test to see if they can do what we say, in a sense. We limit their creativity. There's no creativity when you have to pick A, B, C, or D, and maybe E, all of the above. What do we do in order to change it? What do we do to get rid of politics in school? This is where the conversation takes a turn, because now we're not going to be talking about that there are politics in school. We look at the, I believe it's what, Generation Z? Yeah, I believe it's Generation Z, Burn Curly and Generation Alpha. They're the most gay generation of all time. Why? Did everyone just wake up or they drink the water and they're like, oh, I'm a boy, oh, I'm a girl, oh, I want to be this, I want to like the same sex. I mean, this didn't happen overnight, right? This is not something that is like, okay, well, you know, cool. What I will say is it has always been there, maybe not as prevalent as forefront, but now people are seeing this as, oh, I can do this, get the benefits from being this type of person, and then, of course, I'm going to ride that wave. What happens typically is it just becomes accepted. It's, it's the new normal. So politics are going to be doing that. Politics are going to be looking at what we need to be focusing on or what someone else wants us to focus on instead of what we need to focus on. I know this is sad, but here in America, there's, you know, just, it wasn't even recent. We stopped doing the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. I know when I was still a teacher, we didn't do the Pledge of Allegiance. We did a morning patriotic song. So every morning we would sing a patriotic song. And I know there were certain schools in my district that still implemented this, where they would do the Pledge of Allegiance and they would have a flag in their classroom. But then I remember leaving and maybe like, I would say three years after me leaving, it started to have that movement of taking down the American flags in the classroom. And then putting up pride flags in the classroom. Now, I'm not against pride flags being in the classroom, but it's probably not the place for them. If you want to have a pride flag at your house, on your car, on your lunchbox, on your backpack, okay. But we shouldn't be pledging allegiance to a mindset that is going to be, again, a stigma that might not be the beliefs of what the parent will like for the child. So now, we're allowing a kid because maybe the kid doesn't, you know, or the parent doesn't have the funds to put them in homeschooling or get him a tutor or to put them in a private school or Montessori school, etc. And they just have to settle for whatever their district offers. So if they have a woke teacher that year or they have a teacher that is going to be implementing politics in schools, and I'm not saying that the teacher can't be LGBTQ friendly or part of that type of movement. I'm just saying that are they going to be the type of teacher that does not care about the education, but cares more about pushing the agenda, her agenda, his agenda, the politics? And even though they say it doesn't happen, I've seen it happen. I know it happens. It might not happen every single day. It might not happen at every single do, but it happens enough to make a difference. Because if we think about, I'm going to give a far, far off example. Let's say I'm at the bank right? I'm at the bank and I work at the bank. I'm a teller or I'm, I'm a manager. And you know what? I'm going to start taking a dollar every single day I go to work, 
right? They're not going to miss a dollar. They got plenty of dollars at the bank, right? Well, guess what? Eventually, they're going to say, wait, we have a large discrepancy in how much money we should be having. Someone is taking money. Oh, yeah, you know, I was taking a dollar a day. Like, I didn't think you'll miss it. But now it might have added up if I've been there for several years, thousands of dollars. So now they're like, listen, you took all of this money. You need to give it back. Maybe they're going to arrest me. Of course, I might lose my job too. This right here, in the sense of we don't see what we're doing because in a sense, it seems so small, it's insignificant. What's the worry if we make kids wear masks in schools, we're putting politics in schools? What's the worry if we put pride flags in schools and take out the American flag and we stop doing the Pledge of Allegiance to the country that we should be loving and supporting? We forget what we should be doing for our country. We're so worried about what our government and our country should be doing for us. We forget because politics are in school. Now, you might think that having the flag and having your country and loving your country is politics in school. Guess what? In a sense, it is. But having a mindset where you can love your country and have a feeling that you want to grow as a person is going to counteract any negative politics. And I'm not talking about politics in school, only about, again, government, you know, history, learning about, you know, the standings of, of our forefathers. I'm not talking about that, right? All of that is history. All of that should be taught. A kid should know how the government works, how to vote, what is voting. They should know what that is. They should know about different party affiliations with no influence from the teacher. Again, most students or most kids are going to naturally gravitate to what their parents do. But again, they can also gravitate toward what their friends do. And that is typically what is happening today. We are in a different generation now. We think a lot differently or the generation just growing up is thinking a lot differently. This is the issue. We don't necessarily say that the bad politics in school are bad, but we say the good politics in school are bad. Why the difference? Why not have a dialogue between the two? We can't mix them, right? It's like oil and water. So they say, well, let's give them the water. Let's give them everything watered down. Let's give them what we want to give them. That doesn't help. School used to be a opportunity for people to go learn, get contradicting thoughts, to critically think. Now it's just a place to be indoctrinated. Now it's just a place to learn ideals that might be against what the parent wants for their children. Because I cannot tell you how many parents want good for their children. Then I know there's going to be parents who have ideals that are theirs that they want to give to their children. And it can be as big as a medical procedure, drugs. This can be a big thing. It could be life-changing. And I know doctors, politicians, Heck, even celebrities have come out and say that if you're a parent and you have a 13-year-old looking for these type of things in their life, like drugs, hormone blockers, or stuff like that, where did that come from? Because if the parent's like, I'm not doing that, I didn't promote that, where did they learn it? Did they learn it from TikTok? Did they learn it from social media? I can almost guarantee you they learned it from a friend. They learned it from school. They get a lot of bad ideas in school, these kids. I'm telling you, if you don't believe it, go to middle school for a little bit. You will see a lot of students who are on the right track, you know, when they're in fifth grade, sixth grade, depending on your district and if, when middle school began, you'll see how quick they change and they adapt to the culture of the peers. And the uh, students in those classrooms that do well or resonate with the teacher is a teacher that understands their situation. Doesn't necessarily try to change it. The teacher is just teaching. They're passive in a sense. They're not trying to give them anything. They might offer clarification if they have any questions, but the kid is going to inevitably make their own decision in their own choice. They have that right. But then we look at if we should allow someone 
to mutilate themselves at the age of 13, 14, 15. They're not even an adult yet. We don't even allow them to smoke and drink, yet they still do at that age. They're not mature. Their body is not developed enough. What are we doing? We just allow it. We might tell them, don't do this, don't do that, but they still do. Because it's not so much of what the parents or what the teachers say, it's about what's happening around. Politics happen in school, whether it be the teacher, whether it be the principal, whether it be the district, it's going to happen. We need to focus as a society. We need to set the example. We need to create the tone that people are going to be gaining something as they grow. Right now, they don't gain much. We live in a very secluded type of mindset. Everything can be done on the internet. We have our social medias. We find like-minded individuals. And from there, we stay stuck. Most people stay stuck. And in the terms of politics or in the words of politics today, they don't want people to be united. People who come together that is against them, you know, against what they're going for, is the enemy. They're supremacist. It's a problem. We have our this and that type of thinking, right? If you follow this, then of course, you're good to go. But you follow that, mm mm-mm, that's no good, no bueno. We have politics in schools. It doesn't have to be only about political affiliation. It doesn't mean about the teachers trying to get their kids indoctrinated all the time. The kids are naturally going into school and turning out to be, again, that liberal type mindset. And that is what basically schools have become. Can it change? It can. But it's not going to change readily. The same reason why most of these kids that are coming out of schools have high levels of anxiety, have more fear than ever before, fear of failure, fear of taking action, whatever type of fear, they have it. Again, anxiety, stress, fear. These are not good things to have when you are now graduating high school, maybe going to be thinking about going into college. And then, heck, those college professors are ridiculous nowadays. I've had college professors, and I'm talking about this is 2000, 2006, a long time ago, sharing about politics, talking about you know, political figures. This is college though. So we're a little bit more mature. We get to have a dialogue and stuff. I've had teachers, you know, talk about, you know, being feminists and stuff like that. And you know, how women don't need men. Okay, great. It's a great thing to tell everyone in the class, right? How about the subject? Was that the subject? It could be, right? You could be in that class, but for most classes, you're going to be English, writing, math, maybe your specialty, right? Cool. But most people, they don't want to hear it. Yet most people, they feel obligated to tell people. Why do you think on LinkedIn, they have, you know, so many people with pronouns by their names? Why do you think there's the ability to put your pronouns on almost every social media website now? Politics. And so now we have these, you know, students saying, I'm woke and these are my pronouns and you have to call me and identify me as this and that. And we can look at what Jordan Peterson had to go through and he got in trouble for not calling people what they wanted. This is college. Politics in schools. If you can't see that there are politics in schools, then you might be part of the problem. Not saying that you have to change your life. You get to live your life the way you want. But I always say, if you have a child, unfortunately, it could be good and bad. You can have a parent that wants the best for their child, and then you can have a parent that, you know, wants your, you know, child to be just like them, woke, part of the system, whatever it be, right? You know, I'm talking crazy today. This is going to be difference, you know? There was a video of like a mom and a dad, and, you know, the mom says, you know, this person's not going to get any food or put on, you know, a sign on their door. And the child died because of malnutrition. I'm not saying that they're thinking about politics, you know, in the household, that was abuse, that was neglect. But as you can see, 
how they have that power. A parent has that power. They can raise a healthy and happy child, or they can have a child that's going to be ridden with issues later on in life. And I can't tell you how many people or how many teens and how many children and young adults come to my office because they're on the wrong path. Their parents don't like what path they're on. Hell, they don't even like what path they're on. This, I'm talking about the kids. They're not happy with what is going on in their life. They just don't know how to get out. They don't have anyone to help them. Fortunately, I'm able to give them some guidance. I'm able to give them a bit of security in who they want to become, who they might think they need to be, and then we figure out the best path for them. Sometimes, you know, they are going to do their own thing, even if it goes against their best will and wishes, because that is what their friends are doing. That is what they have learned to do. Not everyone's able to relinquish their ego or relinquish what they have been doing or what they have been building in their life. They stay stuck. A lot of people are stuck today. Politics in schools make people stuck, are going to give our kids a very hard future and is going to be there for quite a long time. I didn't leave teaching because I wasn't making an impact in the schools or I didn't like my job. I saw a bigger problem that was going to come after because I could have still been a teacher, still doing all the things that I need to do and still mindset would be a big issue later on in their life. So I said, I would rather fix these adults, even though it's easier to build strong children into strong adults than to repair broken adults. Apparently the world likes to do it the hard way. So if they want to play hardball, I'm game. Let's do it. Step at a time. We will chip away gradually. Give me a chisel. Give me a hammer. We will make progress. And it might be slow at first, but slow and steady, they say, wins the race. But we do have to have some urgency in this sense. We have to make some changes. And if you are a parent, if you are a person that is struggling with change, if you are a person that has ideas and thoughts in your mind that are not congruent with who you truly want to become, your true self, your true identity, reach out to us here at Reverend Concepts. We'll be more than happy to get on a call to see what's going on in your life and to see how we can help you. As always, my name is Michael Reard. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me coachinginsession at gmail.com and I'll see everyone on the next episode of Coaching In Session. Until then, everyone take care.